Okay, here we are again with uh, Michael Ellis. Michael's here from uh, his dog training school in San Francisco, just outside of San Francisco. We're filming the new video uh, in our series on motivation. And as we do in all of these, we take breaks and answer questions that customers have sent in. Uh, really good questions. We're putting them out there on Learberg's website, on Michael's school's website, and we're offering them now as podcasts so people can take them and download them and listen to them when they drive. This question is a really good question. It's from uh, Erica and uh, I can't tell you uh, how it fits into issues that I've just been involved with, uh, which I'll get into after Michael answers this. My eight month old male standard poodle has recently challenged me by biting me twice. <clears throat> we adopted him from a family that neglected him during the first 16 weeks of his life, leaving him unsocialized and with some behavioral issues. When we brought him home at four months, he had separation anxiety, and if we left him alone, he went crazy, barking excessively nonstop, and he still does. We try and take him on walks and to dog parks as much as possible. He gets along with other dogs great, but he's still very shy towards strangers and will not allow anyone to pet him except my husband and my kids. He uses a prong collar and has no problem with it until recently. I had a couple of guests over one day. He got too excited, so I grabbed him by the prong collar with my hand, and he turned his neck around and tried to bite me while making a huge fuss, whining and barking. So I let go of it, thinking uh, that was all that was needed. Today, as he was outside, he saw a cat. I immediately grabbed him, again by the prong, this time, he attacked me. What should I do? Um, so, a couple of things. So, this brings up all kinds of questions. These, these, these sort of questions are always extremely complicated. Um, when you say the dog challenged you, I would um, probably beg to differ there. I'm thinking that your description of the dog, its lack of socialization, its uh, suspicion of strangers and things like that. Tell me that you have a fearful dog that lacks confidence in general. And so the dogs, uh, a dog like that, a dog that's afraid in stressful situations, if you put pain on that dog, the dog's already focused on something else in the environment that's potentially making them stress they're not comfortable with, uh, and they're acting badly as a result of that. So if you put pain on the dog, those dogs frequently panic, and they protest bite or they come back at you, uh, in a way that they feel threatened, like they need to defend themselves in a, in a sense. And so there's a two-pronged approach here. Obviously, we can't allow our dogs to have aggressive responses work. So one of the first mistakes was when the dog was running around with a prong collar with no leash on it, and you reached out and grabbed it, and the dog turned to bite you, and you let go, that's bad news right there, right? So already the dog's starting to say, hey, I'm stressed, I'm scared, I'm freaking out, this hurts, and I turn and act aggressively, and that works to alleviate the stress. If that works to alleviate the stress, that becomes the dog's coping mechanism. Under stress, bite, and it'll alleviate the stress. And so I think it's less of a challenge and more of a kind of knee-jerk reaction that worked for the dog. And so now the next time it happens, that gets a little more intense. So what you need to do is with that dog, I would take the prong collar off the dog. The prong collar puts pain on the dog, when the dog's already stressed and panicking, more pain is not going to help it. And I would use either a slip lead, a dominant dog type collar on a lead, or just one of the Mendota slip leads that you slip over the dog's head. And then your next step, and the most important part, so that if the dog starts to do something, you can stop the dog calmly. The dog tried to bite you. You could calmly stop the dog without panicking them further and without putting more pain on them. This is not easy to do necessarily, and I recommend you get help with that kind of work. Um, but the more important part is addressing the dog's confidence issues, which means you need to develop motivation in that dog for either a food reward or a toy reward. You need to deliberately take that dog out around people and other things that might make the dog nervous and provide the dog with good experiences. That doesn't mean that they go say hi to everybody. Doesn't mean they go play with every dog. Doesn't mean any of those things. It means you just get the dog out in proximity to new things and provide them with good experiences. So our goal here is to build the dog's confidence so the dog is not stressed. And then if the dog acts badly, you can interrupt it with the slip lead or the dominant dog collar. I don't do that. And then as soon as the dog stops, go back to feeding the dog and getting the dog to relax. The other thing is lots of people, when their dog behaves badly, 
quickly try to get the dog out of that circumstance. So your dog gets scared, panicked, growls, jumps, acts badly. You go, ooh, shoot, and you take your dog and you get away from whatever it is that's prompting the dog to act badly. If you do that, then the dog learns that those bad behaviors also alleviate their stress. So what you want to do is hang out in the area where the dog was having a problem until it's over, until the dog relaxes and settles into that environment, which means you, you shouldn't take this dog out. Your dog's young, eight months old, shouldn't be taking this dog anywhere without food rewards uh, or toy rewards on you. And I would get rid of the prong collar completely at this stage. So that brings us back to uh, what I started to talk about at the beginning of this question thing about prong collars, and especially uh, if you go to our website and our prong collar page, I've done two short little videos on why I chose not to sell quick release or buckle release style prong collars. Now, Michael explained, and I agree a thousand percent, that this person shouldn't have a prong collar on this dog. The fact is, a lot of people make the same mistake that she makes. Then a lot of people make the mistake of reaching down and grabbing their dog around the neck when there's a problem. And when they have a, a quick release prong collar on it, it's just too easy to reach down and grab a dog and accidentally release that dog. And really when you stop and think about it, if an inexperienced handler is doing that, and again, they shouldn't do it, but they do do it, and they release it. They're releasing the dog at a time when they need the most control on it. I mean, I'm aware of a situation uh, where an inexperienced trainer had a dog aggressive rescue dog who was walking down the street and a couple had a poodle in their front yard and the poodle was tied up. Uh, this man with his leash was walking and the dog lit up on this poodle and he, rather, and he had it on a leash rather than controlled the dog with the leash, he grabbed the dog by the collar the same way this lady did, and he accidentally released that dog. His dog went over and killed the poodle, and it was a very expensive lawsuit. So we just made the decision that these buckle collars, these quick release prong collars are an unsafe product. So don't even put them on your dog. If you have the one, my advice is don't use it. Get rid of it. But be, yeah. I think it's important to, to distinguish there are mechanical failings of a tool that's appropriate for a dog. This is what Ed is talking about here, right? So one of the problems of prong collars or electric collars and things like that is they don't always work when you want them to. Like, so a prong collar can come undone and come off your dog. Very dangerous situation. Electronic collar may not make contact, the battery may be down, it may not function when you want it to. So we have equipment failures that can happen in dog training, which are a bad thing. So the, the more we can back that up and make safety, around those things, the better off we are. But there's also the question, and I think the more important question coming from this, the, the more important topic that comes up from her discussion, is the appropriate tool for a dog. And to me, the, in the nutshell, she has an under-socialized, fearful dog, and pain on that dog is not going to help. If you put, at a prong collar, it administers pain. So if I have a dog that's confident and comfortable and understands the tool, and their behavior is based on overstimulation or prey-based behavior, and then I can put pain on them to stop, that stop them from doing something they know they're not supposed to do, then it can be a functional tool. But you have to be very careful with dogs that are scared, uh, lacking confidence or things, applying pain to them, because they panic easily. And when they panic, it's like a dog, you're trying to help a dog that's been hurt. A dog gets hit by a car and you go try to help it and your own dog bites you. That's not out of dominance, it's not challenging you, it's because that dog is panicking. They're afraid, they're scared, they have pain, they're in pain, and dogs do lash out in those circumstances. So be very, very careful with prong collars and nervous and fearful dogs. You have to be very careful. That's what we answer. We get a lot of questions on this, Cindy and I both do, and, and more often than not on these dogs, almost all the time, these prong collars make them more hectic. And, and Michael brought up a good point about these about prong collars needing to be used correctly on the, on the right dogs. Uh, but prong collars come apart, which is why uh, anybody that all buys a prong collar <laughs> all the time, anybody that buys a prong collar from Learbird uh, has to agree that we explain that they need to have a backup collar, a backup dominant dog collar attached to that dog at the same time they're using the prong collar. Because if the prong collar comes apart, your dog is loose if you don't have a backup collar. 
So you can't buy a prong collar from me unless you check that box that you agree that it has to have a backup collar. So it's an important thing. They, prongs have their place, uh, but as Michael said, they're one of the most, uh, those and remote collars are a great training tool, but also one of the most abused training tool, misused Absolutely. training tool. Absolutely. You know? We just, uh, we just released a new leash called a prong collar leash uh, that we actually patented uh, and trademarked the name on. And I'll put a picture of it on the screen here. It's a, it's a leash that has two ends on it, one shorter than the other. One end has a clip that clips to the prong collar. The other has a clip that'll clip uh, to the dominant dog collar or the backup leash. So when you give a correction, the correction comes from the shortest leash, which is attached to the prong collar. But your dog will never be loose if the prong collar comes apart and you have a backup dog, uh, backup uh, collar on it. So good question, brought up interesting information, safety information that's important to all new dog trainers.